Welcome to One Community Church here in Westchester, Ohio, and this time of opening our hearts to this season of glory and praise. Westchester, Middletown, Monroe, Liberty Township, Hamilton, Lebanon. We reach out as One Community Church to this place and beyond and give thanks to God for the great goodness that God has bestowed upon us over the years of ministry from this place into the far reaches of our community and into the world. It is a time for us to breathe, to pause, to rest, and to give thanks. Let's listen now as we open our hearts to give thanks for those of you who are new and especially our visitors for this day. We ex expect, expect a hearty welcome from all of our folks to make people hos hospitable and uh, friendly, and this is a time in which we encourage you, if you're a guest with us or consider yourself a guest, uh, to make sure before you leave to receive a gift in the back. There's a table as you enter our fellowship hall. We'd like to bestow upon you a gift, a token of our appreciation. And now through the wonderful media presentation, we op open ourselves to this um, announcements for this day. Let's see what we have today. Good morning. Um, welcome, One Community Church family. I'm Ann Schusterman. I'm on session here. And I have a few announcements for us. Uh, Christmas decorating and chili luncheon, always fun. We will have fellowship event for the church here on November 27th from 10 to 1230. Come for any part of it. We're decorating the church. Um, it will be fun. It's child friendly. It's family friendly. Uh, it is the Saturday after Thanksgiving. You can come for part of it or all of it, but you will definitely want to be there at noon when Kevin pulls out his chili. So you need to be there for that. Chili lunch together after decorating. We want to make the church look beautiful for the Advent season and for all the guests who will be coming during the month of December. Our second announcement is the Community Christmas Concert. We are hoping we'll have lots of guests for our One Community Christmas Concert. It will be on Sunday, December 5th at 2 o'clock. Make plans to come and enjoy a combined music program with both contemporary and temporary or traditional music ministries. We'll have Christmas cookies and hot chocolate after the concert, and be sure to bring your family, neighbors, people off the street, coworkers, friends, anybody. Invite all the people that you can think of. It should be a really good time. Thank you so much. Have a great day.
Praise God. Join with me in our call to worship today. Let us proclaim a day of thanksgiving among ourselves, people of God. This is a day of gratitude for the one who has promised to gather his flock and bring us back into the fold where fruitful life may thrive. God has promised to raise up a shepherd for us so that we might not fear or wander away, a shepherd who will deal with us and with all with love and justice. In Jesus Christ, we have a great shepherd. Let us return with thanksgiving to the one who guards and guides our lives. Let us pray. O God, light of the hearts that see you, life of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you, to turn from you is to fall, to turn to you is to rise, to abide in you is to stand fast forever. Although we are unworthy to approach you or to ask anything at all of you, grant us your grace and blessing for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Let us stand and sing our first hymn today as we open ourselves to music, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. to confession. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace that we may have mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. We come to the time of reading of sacred scripture. Let us pray. O oh God, by your Spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Today's reading will be from the book of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Pray, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Think the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I want to begin by asking a question. What comes to mind when you hear the word gratitude? I expect that most definitions run something like this. It is the acknowledgement of some benefit received and an expression of anticipation for the same. This describes what took place on that first Thanksgiving. Those pilgrim mothers and fathers had experienced providential care, and they set aside one day to convey their thanks to God. Now, much could be said about this familiar approach, but I want to come at the subject from a different direction. Instead of thinking of gratitude as praise toward God, I want us to consider it as a test of spiritual maturity. I have decided that of all the measurements of a person's soul, none is more penetrating than the reality which is central to this season of thanksgiving. Therefore, I want us to think for a few moments about the nature of gratitude. Not so much about what it says about God, but what it can say about you. When I mention the process of testing, I realize I am talking about a unique American phenomenon. We as a nation are probably more interested in personality measurements than any other people in the world. Our whole philosophy of education and business is heavily dependent upon it. From the cradle to the grave, we are victims of what we might call assault and battery. That is, we are assaulted by a battery of tests in every area. The preschool child is given an aptitude test. The school-age child, an IQ test. High schoolers, the college board. The, the college students, the graduate exam. And on and on we go. And needless to say, one's performance on these tests welds a mighty influence upon one's future. I was amused the other day at Kroger's there in the checkout line to see on the magazine the title was, How Sexy Are You? Ten Questions. <laughs> and Red Book's article, How Much Do You Know About Your Dog's Health? Eight questions. Well, suffice it to say, we modern Americans are familiar with tests. Just ask these on the first row. I believe the same curiosity that motivates us in other areas is also active in the spiritual realm. Did you ever take a spiritual test? What would you put on a spiritual test? People are anxious to know how they measure up in their inner lives, and this, of course, presents a difficulty. How do you gauge a person's soul? What criterion do you employ to get an insight into their spirit? You need some test that reflects the whole inner person. In fact, this is what is wrong with so many popular measuring sticks. They are limited to only one facet of the inner life and do not penetrate the essence of the soul. Let's think about a spiritual test. There are some who attempt to gauge a person's spirit by analyzing the things one believes. They are interested in a person's intellectual credo. Show me the issues to which one gives assent, and I will pass a verdict on their spiritual life, they say. Now, I would be the last one to underestimate the importance of doctrinal belief. 
all action is ultimately rooted in thought. And therefore, it does make a difference what a person believes. But we must realize that intellectual opinion can be detached from the rest of life. I can embrace a certain idea in my mind and never let it penetrate the vital spring of my personality. I can believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and never worship the God above me, the God before me, and the God within me. I can believe in loving my neighbor, and yet at the same time harbor a vicious prejudice against members of another race. I can believe in honesty, yet refuse to invite my conscience in when I fill out my income tax. This is the whole problem. Intellect is just one part of life, and a test that involves no more can give, cannot give a really true picture. The writer of the epistle of James says, even the devil believes. This test is not enough. Neither are the test of words. Here again, some put all the emphasis on verbal confession. If a person will just say the right formula, if one will utter the proper phrases or cliches, then this is the measure of their soul. Now, of course, words are important. If we realize how important they were and how much power they weld, perhaps we would be more careful about what we say. But when all of that is admitted, we still must realize that talk is not everything. The problem is that we humans can utter words that do not actually accord with reality. For example, I'm capable at this moment of forming the words, I am President Biden. I can say that, of course, and it is not so. I can even say I am a rich man, and that is further from the truth than the first f statement. <laughs> you see, our ability to falsify means that words are never enough. Jesus once said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. These are inadequate tests. And so is another familiar criteria, outward deeds. There are many who exalt this as the measuring rod. Show me a person's conduct, they say. By their fruits you will know them. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. You hear these a lot. And who would deny the importance of good works? They are significant. But can we trust them exclusively to gauge one's spirit? Here again, we have a problem. Just as we can utter falsehoods, so we can act deceptively. I can create an appearance by certain actions that is totally different from who I am. This is what angered Jesus about the Pharisees. They were play actors, whitewashed tombstones, phonies, appearing to be one thing when actually they were another. Their capacity to act to be other than ourselves, invalidates deeds as an absolute test. Again, Jesus said, In the last day, many will say, Lord, have not we done mighty works in your name? And Jesus will reply, Depart from me, I never knew you. But if belief and words and deeds are not adequate test. How can we ever get a line on our spiritual condition? Here is the way. How grateful are you? How grateful are you? When some good deed is done for you, how do you respond? 
This is far more comprehensive than any of the other tests. This lays bare the inner soul. As a person reacts to the good that comes, one betrays the real set of their soul. Look at the experience found in the scripture text from St. Luke. Jesus was walking toward Jerusalem one day, and ten lepers cried out for help. These men, who were totally isolated and hopeless in outlook, Jesus took pity on them and healed them. Now, watch what happened. Judged by belief, they all passed, for they looked to him and called for help. In terms of words, they were the same, for they all called out. They even passed the test for deeds, for they all obeyed him. But there is the crucial test here. How did they respond to this act of mercy? Nine were so self-centered that they rushed out to use their newfound health as they pleased. Only one recognized that this had come from without and came back to thank Jesus. Now, I say that these responses of gratitude and ingratitude were telling insight into the spiritual condition of the lepers. By what they did with this act of healing, they revealed the central loyalty of their lives. Nine took the experience and interpreted it only in terms of self. One took the experience and interpreted it as a gracious inbreak from without. These different responses are significant for the difference between self-centeredness and other-centeredness is ultimate. If you will read the New Testament carefully, it says life is moving in one of two directions. Either we are organizing life around ourselves, or we are organizing it around God and others. One love is absolute, either love of self or love of that which is other than self. The foreboding truth is this. We will get in eternity exactly what we live for. Or, to be more precise, we will get whom we live for. This, then, is the structure of life, moving in or moving out. And the act of gratitude is the acid test of how we stand. If you have good things happen, and you instinctively move toward the outside source, like the one leper... This is a sign of spiritual health. But if you take what comes and never look back and think only of how you can use it, like the nine, this is a sign of spiritual sickness. Gratitude, then, is more than an insight into God. It is an insight into ourselves. Your beliefs, your words, your deeds, all of these are partial. The real question is this, how grateful are you? How do you respond to that which is done for you? Do you move out or do you take in? I like the story about the man who had a dream 
He dreamed that he had died and he was escorted to the far country by an angel who explained that in death that all people's elbows were stiffened in death. When they went below, it was a scene of frustration. People had food, but they could not get it to their mouths. Every person was thinking only of themselves, and they were fighting and struggling in their desperation. When he was taken above, the atmosphere was truly different. Here, too, the elbows were stiff. But because everyone was concerned about feeding the other, they learned to sit face to face and feed each other. Could it be that the eternal distinction, the difference in heaven and hell, is thinking of others or thinking of self? I think that it is. And gratitude is the grand test to determine one's condition. Therefore, in this season approaching Thanksgiving Day, let us set forth gratitude as a spiritual test and dare you, I do, to apply it to your own life. By it, you can learn not only what you are, but also get some direction of where you are headed. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come in prayer to you this day with a sense of thanksgiving for all the gifts that we have received from your hand. We thank you for the gift of life, for love, for work, play, hopes and dreams, and tasks yet to be done for our country and for this church. We confess before you all our problems, but we ask that you accept us and bring us into your fold as people that are truly grateful. Speak to us, O oh God, and we will respond with grateful hearts. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join with me as we stand and sing a hymn of affirmation of our faith. Pass me not.
may be seated. We are a blessed people. In this season of thanksgiving, it is good that we recall God's many gifts in our lives and grace which God has given us to help us use them all for good. Let us consider just how welcomed we are to share the gifts of God for the sake of the world as we give regularly in good habits. You can either get in the habit of dropping an offering in the box here at the door, or a habit of sending it in the snail mail to the church address here, or perhaps talking to your bank or making a donation through our website. Many ways to form good habits of making God's gifts known to the world. The gifts of God are many. Let us give thanks for our offerings this day. Let us pray. Abundant God, prophecy says you are coming with the clouds for every eye to see. Until that day, may our gifts and offerings we bring each week do the holy work of making your reign real in this community and into the world and into its need. Hear our prayers, O God. With grateful hearts, we bring before you the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing our doxology. Would you stand? seated. We come to a time of communion and our ruling elder Kevin is coming to uh, make our blessing for us and for the, this holy meal as we open ourselves to this time. Let me remind you, it is our reformed tradition that we have the communion here in front of the baptismal fount, meaning that this is a celebration of two wonderful gifts that God has given us. Entry into God's kingdom with holy baptism of being sealed in God's grace and the partaking of grace this day around the table in which the blessed Jesus is our guest. It is his table. Because it is his table, he turned no one away from it. And we turn no one away today. If you love Jesus, this meal is for you. You are welcomed. Let me invite you to think about baptism. If you're not, this is a welcoming church. Thank you, Pastor Steve. I, um, for those of you that know me, I'm pretty at ease with a microphone in my hand or speaking in public. I think you would say that. I, uh, I at least think I'm pretty cool in social circumstances or uh, maybe at ease is a better word for that also. And yet when I sit up here and I'm called to get to share this with all of us, I'm pretty blown away. So I just mm -hmm. want you to know where my heart is when I'm doing this. It, it really just kind of just puts me in perspective of, of what a gracious God we have. Mm -hmm. So, friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They'll come from the east and the west and from the north and the south, and they'll sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And at that time, then, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. 
Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. And the Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, at the Passover meal, he took the cup, and he was saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And every time you eat this bread, drink from this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord Jesus until he comes again. Amen. We ask you that you take the elements, the bread, and take and eat. The body of Christ. Same way, we take the cup and we drink from his blood. Pastor Steve, I ask that you bless this meal. Thank you. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us rejoice. We serve a resurrected Christ, He is alive. He has beckoned us to his table, and we rejoice in the fact that we are called to be his children, alive and well, in this day, in this place, for this task. We have been placed on this planet, in this time, in these places. It is no accident. Let us serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. Let us pray. Bless all your children, God, and pour out your Spirit upon us. Bring healing, comfort, and strength wherever it is needed. All this we ask in the name of the one who calls us forward in faith, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray as one, we now pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join with me as we stand and sing our hymn, We Gather Together. be seated. 
We come now to a time for blessing and benediction before we leave our service and before we enter in, back into our world. Our baptism, being one with Christ at table, our life together, God is good. Let us be about showing God's goodness to those who are not feeling it, who feel separate from God, and send the invitation out with loving and grateful hearts. Let us pray. On our way as we leave, O oh God, lift us up and refresh us that we would practice gratitude for the things you have done in our lives over and over again to bring us to this place and to give us a good hope and a good future and the hope and blessedness of eternal life with you. Stir within us, O oh God, the power that you sprinkle into our lives and then pour on liberally without uh, an abundance, uh, with an abundance. We thank you, O oh God, that you give us the strength to go on. And that your presence is with us through good and bad. All the way, you have promised to bring us to the very end, to the banquet table in heaven itself, because of your great love for us. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.